Thank you all Nigerians. Thank you our well wishes. I just want to say thank you to everybody and glory to God Almighty. All right, that, that actually it brings to the campaign slogan uh, going in the. Uh, we, we, we had it that it is uh, only God. That was the slogan. And it didn't quite sit well, we understand, with some uh, people who believe that that was not strong enough politically. Uh, talking about. So, uh, how uh, did you come up with that and then the result now uh, speaking for itself? Uh, well, um, let me say here that, um, first of all, I return all glory to God Almighty for the victories, and I dedicate that victory to God Almighty and then to all our Quibomites. Let me also express my sincere gratitude to our own people for standing by me, standing with me, and then standing for me. Uh, it's all embracing. Uh, I've not seen that level of unity, of purpose, of love, and well expressed by our people. Uh, these shoes and this comes to actually justify what you're, you're saying, that our writing mantra was only God, divine mandate only God. Uh, whether I sit well with people or not, unfortunately politics is where I come to discover that uh, people don't bring God factor into politics, but um, uh, I think that's a miscalculation. Everything begins and ends with God Almighty. So. Uh, the more you acknowledge this, the more God appreciates it. Uh, the Bible says so that he made known his ways only unto Moses. <laughs> and only his acts to the people. Let those who want to know the acts know the acts. But I want to know him more according to Paul. So that's why we actually had to know that all power belongs to God. And he gives it to whom he wishes. So that's why we say only God can take us there. Only God can give us what we want. And only God will always reign supreme in everything that we do. Is acknowledging him in all our ways. All right, sir. That, that also uh, brings us to the question of uh, uh, the, the run-up to the election. Of, of course, a quiet bomb state variously uh, referred to as a flashpoint uh, in the states where elections were coming. Uh, you must have been uh, concerned and bothered uh, as well that maybe uh, these people were right. And it must have been really challenging as the chief security officer in the state you must have been worried that uh, things might go wrong at some point. Um, that would be a contradiction of faith and belief. Uh, because, you see, you need to know whom you believe in life and what you stand for. Fine. I mean, as a human being, even God himself was challenged. If you're a human being, you don't have challenges, I wonder what kind of human being you'll be. So those challenges will always bring out the best in you, which is why you're seeing the result today. If those challenges were not there, probably wouldn't have prayed to God the way we prayed. Because let me tell you something about leadership. Either you are to the right or you are to the left. There's no middleman. Every single leader you see in Nigeria today must decide. Is he to the left or is he to the right? There's no middleman in leadership. So uh, those challenges, are, I mean, do come out to actually also show, uh, bring out the best in you. Fine. I mean, there were a whole lot of challenges, a whole, whole lot of challenges. And a whole lot of them you've seen. Uh, is it toggery? Is it fake uh, army uniform, fake police uniform, uh, all sorts? And those things we shouted out and they were real. We didn't shout out out of fears. We shouted out so that the world might know the challenges that we are facing. So that when we overcome, all glory will still go back to God. Uh, because you see, I mean, men try to arrogate uh, to themselves powers that they don't have. And um, all sorts of things happened and I don't want to go back in, into those things, but um, we had a whole lot of challenges. And uh, you could see a situation where uh, we were not afraid. We, it emboldened us. We had to be more courageous and also we had to determine because knowing that he who had brought us this far <laughs> is ever faithful and ever sure, he can never fail. And um, if you put your trust in him, which is still coming up back to what we believed in. He say it can only be God that can help us surmount those things, and it has never disappointed. All right, that's uh, uh, really be quite instructive and uh, interesting. Uh, now we're coming uh, to the governance itself. In 2015, you had a five-point agenda, correct? Uh, policy thrust, uh, correct? Five-point agenda, correct? And uh, if I'm not mistaken, wealth creation, correct? Um, poverty alleviation, correct. economic and political inclusion, uh, inclusion, and all of that. that correct. Talking about e economic and political inclusion, I went round. I was in the local government. I saw a village where 
we could see some very old people, very old people actually coming out to vote. And that was have been part of the, the success. When you're talking about political inclusion and all of that, uh, uh, you were able to get uh, these uh, people from the very uh, remote uh, areas and the highbrow uh, part of the state. Um. But see, let me let me say something here to Nigerians. Um, we 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 meant every aspect of those things that we put down uh, in writing. Uh, I I keep saying so. Uh, some of us were prepared for leadership, so you don't come into leadership just by accident. I think uh, uh, before we came in even in that 2015, we had a blueprint. We knew those things we could do to connect with the grassroots, and we also discovered that. Um, all these um, flamboyant uh, projects not really connecting to the grassroots uh, will not help. And also, you are not in office for yourself. You are not in office for self-aggrandizement. You are not in office just for that ego. God will put you in an office for a purpose. So the earlier you realize that purpose, the better for you, so that you can actually get connected with that purpose, because God is a God of purpose. So I think we realize that on time. And um, we've led the foundation. We're going to build on it. I think if you were able to follow us during the mop-up campaigns on Wednesday and Thursday, last Wednesday, last Thursday, you would see genuine joy, happiness, all over people. And people could actually say, yes, this is our leader. This is a leader we've connected with. This is a leader that is passionate about our welfare. This is a leader that, if he has the resources, will actually take us there. This is a leader that does not just believe only in himself. This is a selfless leader. This is a leader that will probably show us a whole lot. And this is a leader that is actually showing us the way. So people are excited. People are happy. Uh, people feel that connection. So, and you also see a situation where we're running a government now, highly detravelized. Nobody cares about your ethnic uh, you know, group or sentiment. Completely devoid of that. And people just look around me and could see also that as part of me. You could see all people walking around me. You hardly could see, oh, this is my kinsman. My ADC is from Borno State. My chief detail is from Edo State. My, you can keep counting. My CSO is, is that. So we, we just spread around. We, we take joy in building one state and one Nigeria. And not even outside that, driving policies that will go back to the basics. The basics for any developing nation are those social infrastructure that we need to look at. Healthcare delivery system, you know, the food security is also important. Availability and affordability. Then you also look at situations of, uh, you know, education is quite key. And all the social services. I went around these local government areas, told the youth that can we have a social contract? Let's know what a social contract will be. Let me deliver my own part. And you must also deliver your part. And between that 2015, by September, we launch, you know, a moral rebirth, which we call the Dakada philosophy, which means that you must believe in yourself. You must have the right passion. That once the passion is right, nothing is impossible. You must also realize your potentials. You must also look at yourself that, look, I'm an able-bodied youth. What I have is all that I need for God to take me to where I'm supposed to be. No self-pity. No self-pity. Just look at yourself. Everything you have as of today is what will take you to where you're supposed to be. Don't just start beating about it. Don't just feel that inferior. I mean, uh, these are things that had actually driven people. People had actually seen that it's working and it's connecting. And people are actually seeing where, what will be the, uh, the, the end result. So I think they are glad. They look forward to it. And with this, you can actually see the attendant peace that we're actually enjoying in this part of, of, of the country. Exceptional. The kind of peace that you read, you know, in the Holy uh, Leadership book that passes human understanding, which only God can give, not man. So I, at the end of the day, I still say so. I give all glory to God Almighty, and that's all. Yes, uh, really, it has been uh, against uh, uh, some uh, uh, people's expectations because uh, uh, quite a lot of people uh, felt that quiet bomb will be hot and explosive before and after the election and it is uh, a really uh, a wonderful development uh, uh, that uh, after the election everything has been peaceful i've been around uh you the capital and i was uh, following the elections went as far as uh, Ika, uh, 
uh, to check how things uh, went. Uh, but let's uh, still come back to uh, uh, the agenda. Yes, you had a five-point agenda the last time, uh, the last uh, four years. Uh, what are you most have touched on them? But what are you uh, going uh, to come up with going into the next uh, four years? Um, if I start doing going through the manifesto of my re-election, I think uh, the time for this program will not take us. I'll only give you a copy and probably you try and do justice to it. But we're on what we call a completion agenda. Uh, you what don't. Does that, what does that mean? A completion agenda sets to achieve those five points that we actually set that up in issue. You can't be changing every now and then. Some of these things are medium to long term. It's not something you achieve overnight. Uh, take, for example, poverty alleviation. It's, it's ongoing. Anywhere in the world is ongoing. So it's not something you can just as a flashpoint achieve and then you, you withdraw, which is what I keep telling people. It's a process. You must drive it down and then until you, you get to where you're going to. And it's also like somebody building, you know, a high-rise building. You keep setting up until you, you reach there. But I, I just discovered that we are not there yet, which is something that we set it out clearly in our, in our own completion agenda. Taking and then appraising. You know, we, at, at that point in time, we needed to reappraise uh, the five point agenda and then we needed to redefine those uh, parameters and indices, indices that we can measure that will take us to where we are going to. So that's exactly what we've, we've done. We, we actually took time to appraise what have we done so far? Where are we? Because in life, where people also fail to get it right is at each point that you must pause and find out where am I? Even God asked Adam, he said, Adam, where are thou? Not that God did not know where Adam was. God wanted Adam to realize his own position. But man always so fell, I mean, so many people fell in that, in, in leadership. You must at each point in time pause to, to appraise, where am I? Where am I supposed to be? It's a superlative question. If you don't do that, man, you might just be going elsewhere and you think you're going to the right direction. So. I think that's what the completion agenda, I mean, are taken through and then up to what we need to do probably in the next four years to get to where we are going to. And we are believing that we should be able to achieve it. Right. And then uh, there is always um, the fallout of every contest. Um, you now begin to talk about healing the wounds uh, because an election like this uh, would come with a lot of... Uh, uh, like sports, if there will be some uh, games and all of that, and everyone uh, fighting in which other uh, in, a, in any way possible. And then, of course, after the elections, there will be wounds, and those wounds have to be healed. And it is on you, the owners, uh, to actually uh, mm. see how those wounds of election can be healed. How do you intend to do that? Uh, well, let me. Uh, say something here clearly to the entire world. I think in this case we were the ones that were bruised, completely bruised. As I'm talking now, a whole lot of my people are still in detention. A whole lot of my supporters, for just no reason. Uh, we had a situation where, uh, even up to the last presidential election, where people were totally intimidated, molested, unlawfully and also unlawfully detained, especially by the police uh, formation here in Akwaibo. And um, that was actually spearheaded by an assistant inspector general of police, who's supposed to have actually been in charge of the zone. He relocated down to the state, he sat down here. All he does is, if he knows you're supporting the present governor, uh, you, are, you are good for detention until after the election. I just hope now that the election is over, most of them will be released. A whole lot of families have suffered that terrible human abuse, which should not have been. But let me also state here clearly, election is just a process and is a major ingredient of democracy that Nigerians should help us look at election in that way. Uh, so we're the ones bruised here. I'm sure you also saw it two, three days before the last governorship election. You could see the number of thugs that were imported outside into the state. They were close to 8,000. And these were people that were imported to come and, you know, uh, brutalize your people. So I now wonder, the people you want to govern, 
why do you do this injustice to your people? I mean, fine, I don't know, I don't, I'm not here to judge, I'm not, I'm not a security uh, agent, but you can hear the video uh, in circulation. What mayhem people planned. But you know one thing I like about God? Man proposes, God disposes. Uh, that's why Job was so clear and, and succinct in putting it right. He said that the Lord God Almighty disappointed all devices of the evil man, that their hands cannot perform their evil plans. So that's why you could see that mantra will always continue to ring bells in the minds of people that only God, even with all those political toggery intimidation. But let me also use this opportunity to tell people that political parties just become a platform for you to serve. It has nothing to do with the Pybom project. A Pybom project is a project for everybody. All hands must be on deck. Now that election is over, we should all settle for governance. And I want to reassure, I extend that same uh, you know, in, in, in invitation to, to, to anybody who contested with me on any political platform that Aquabon is for everybody. And we have a very open arm to, to receive people so that we can join hands together and take this step to where we're supposed to be. It doesn't matter which political part, platform that, you know, you, you sought your, 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 your political, um, you know, relevance or probably how to save your people. But now that the winner has emerged, it's not a winner takes it all kind of situation. We actually want to extend that to all those who contested with me and say that we are ready to work together from, well, in quotes, because a lot of people at times also misuse that phrase from what we call a unity government, where what you have is all that we need. It doesn't matter. Once you're an archival matter and you have all the text to deliver, then we'll take you. Uh, we don't care which political platform you, you, you sought to be in that office. So I think that's a, a, a big invitation that we're doing right now. And uh, I still want to stand on that, that we are ready to work with everybody in order to look at Aquibom as a project. Uh, politics will come and go, but Aquibon people will remain the same. And wherever we go to, we remain who we are. So I really, really want to believe that they will also accept that and then come together so that we can actually jointly make this state one of the greatest in this continent. All right. Uh, uh, looking at you, uh, you, you, you exhibit some mien of peace and unassuming uh, posture, uh, peaceful person. And uh, is, is it something that uh, you, you make out in public? Are you actually as peaceful as you are? Because you, as you look, you look like a man who is not given to trouble. And how have you been able to ensure that this state has been peaceful in spite of uh, the, 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 the reckoning of uh, quite a lot of people? Uh, Basi, let me tell you something. Uh, uh, if you've lived on earth for over 50 years, you can't fake certain threats that you have, certain attributes. Uh, that's your nature of nature. Uh, it's like somebody, you know, uh, saying you can, you cannot. Any state you go to, anywhere you go to, what the ambience, the aura, the feeling, the, what, what, you, what, what you can sense uh, depicts the leadership. I keep saying so, it's probably lack of understanding, uh, I mean, and I told you up in issue that I don't do that contradiction of belief. So if you believe that without peace there can be progress, without peace there can be prosperity, you must live peace, you must talk peace, you must also exhibit peace. I, I think that's what builds up. It's, it's one of those things that, that I believe in and I also have in me. And outside that, if you don't seek to be in peace with one another, what do you actually gain in, in being violent, in being a tyrant? It doesn't actually pay. It does not pay. What pays most is that peaceful disposition towards matters. That's what actually makes things work. Uh, things don't work well by just uh, in an environment. You know, everything development is a coward. I hope you know that development, money, anything that has to do with development is a coward. It does not go to where it does not feel safe. And it can only feel safe at the environment that is peaceful. So if you see people who are naturally peaceful and passionate about peaceful disposition to matters, I think uh, they are more forward-looking, they are more broad-minded, and uh, they, are, they, they are more receptive. I think um, that's how God created me, 
and I also try to develop on it as well to make sure that the only thing, the only way forward, the only thing that can actually ensure that we achieve what we need to achieve is peace. There's no substitute for peace anywhere on earth. That's why every single, you know, international organization, bodies, communities, and so on, the best and the most, you know, uh, important thing they preach about is peace all over. Because without peace, there can't be prosperity. You can't even live well. You can't even feel well yourself. Uh, that peaceful disposition uh, makes you even have a healthy living as well. Uh, you don't allow things to drag you down so that you can have a broad mind so you can think well. It, it broadens your thought process when you are at peace with yourself. And um, also, let me still take you back. If you're back to what you believe in, uh, we believe in Jesus Christ as a Christian. And when he was about to be born, the Bible says, he shall be called the Prince of Peace. Why was it so necessary for him to be called Prince of Peace? And he said the government shall be upon his shoulder. It was added. So which means that a government that will be successful, a government that will drive the purpose of God shall be a peaceful government. And that's what whenever, once you drop at the airport, you feel it. And um, we, we want to build more on that. And we want to see a state that will even be absolutely peaceful, where people will live in one accord, in that unity, so that we can actually... Uh, have it as a, a shared value system here. Uh, anybody will know that Kwebun people are naturally peaceful people. We don't like troubles and so on. So when you hear some of these things, you know it's important or probably it's, it's out of selfish interest. And we try to rise to let people know, know that we rise for togetherness in this state. A major signpost of your uh, achievement in government is that uh, airline the first state in Nigeria. Not in Nigeria, in Africa. In Africa. Correct. It's good, to, it's good to, to know that. I mean, tell us more about it. Um, let me start from the business perspective of Ibom Air. The business perspective is that before now, it takes you three days to go for a business meeting in Lagos or in Abuja. Whether you like it or not, in Nigeria, the way we run our system, no state government, you don't have, you, you don't have control over policies. Policies are made in Abuja. So Abuja remains the federal capital territory. That's where the presidency is. That's where, so a whole lot of business concerns will tilt towards Abuja. And of course, Lagos is the business capital of Nigeria. That's why I'm using those two cities as an example. It takes you three days to attend meetings. Take, for example, if you've had a meeting on a Monday morning like this, say about 10, 11 in the morning in Lagos, you're supposed to have left since yesterday, being Sunday. And by the time you finish that meeting, the last flight would have, would have gone. So you must sleep back again, and then you return on a Tuesday. But we're telling people, no, that's not how to do business. If we're actually creating a business hub in Akwaibom, if we actually want to make Akwaibom that logistic hub for the, for the region, people should be able to do business at ease. And one of those ways is a means of transportation. So we're setting up a Bomeir line where you can actually attend a business meeting in Lagos in the morning and return in the evening. That's number one. And number two, if you look at also the fleet, will be one of the newest in the entire country. We also look at the safety of lives of people. Then look at the value chain. Don't ever ignore that. The value chain of that economic prosperity the airline will bring. Direct employment now that we have is just about 300. But look at indirect employment. will be close to 3,000. What economic impact that will create in the state is going to be marvelous. And mind you, if you're running an airline business, the economic value is derived from all over the world. By the time we start a regional flight, it doesn't actually ma matter. You can make money in Sierra Leone, and we spend the money for you in Aquaibum. You can make money in Lagos, and we help you spend the money here. Make money in Abuja, we help you spend the money here. And that's how to draw economic value. Then, if you look at that, and then look at also the value chain this will bring, there's no how. And also, let me say so, Development will also go to where there's that ease of development. And you must create an enabling environment for development to strive. So we can't be talking about all those five-point agenda, economic prosperity, job creation, wealth creation, without creating an enabling environment. And it's left for government to create an enabling environment. Let me also correct people who do not understand the business. I read in the, somebody, you know, showed me something that was written in the, in, in the social media platform you could see lack of proper understanding. That's why it's always better for you to run government 
honestly in Nigeria, it should be required of so many people that you must have been able to run a successful business. Because even when we talk about dividends of democracy, dividend is a private sector word. It's a, it's a bottom line. Uh, have you paid dividend? You know, it drives a whole lot of share value. But you know in government, there's not the unit of measurement are not that much. Let me tell people, when people were criticizing, oh no, how can government? People had forgotten. Emirates Airlines is one of the best today, one of the largest today in the entire planet Earth. You want to tell me there's no government in it? So, major airlines, you want to tell me Delta just came up like that? What about British Airways? Let's not even go out of Africa. The best airline today in Africa is Ethiopian Airlines. So, if you look at major carriers in that line, there's always a government in it in terms of investment, but in terms of, not in terms of management, in terms of ownership. Because that will drive a name, that will drive a whole lot. In terms of management, you still hand it over to, to the experts. And your business model will also determine whether you succeed or not. You can see how are we starting Ibom Airlines. We didn't go for a Boeing 737, we didn't go for Airbus 320, we didn't go for, uh, you know, uh, those big uh, plans to start a business. What we're looking at here is the frequency of the flight and also the reliability and then services that we're going to provide. Go for newer planes, go for planes that will carry 88, 90 passengers in one run, do many runs and then break even easily. So that even at low times, if you carry 40, 45 passengers, you can easily break even. That's number one. Then number two, make sure that government does not determine those employed there. Look for professionals. Our chief pilot is taken from one of the best airlines in, in, in Africa, one of the most profitable. In fact, say in the entire Middle East and Africa, that's where we took our chief pilot. Our client service executive is drawn from one of the most successful airlines in the whole world. So you can see we are going for professionals. I want to run professional, where ownership will be completely distinct and completely different from management. Is owned by the government today, we want to take it to a certain point, and at that point, we won't do private placement. We'll do a public offering to, to our people, with buyers to acquire boom people. We, by the time we make that public offering, I mean, about the boom airlines, we'll make it easier, we'll make it better. But our business model is designed to succeed. And we also want to prove people wrong, that what works well in other places can also work in Nigeria. What works well? How come all these other airlines are flying to you today? Look at how did uh, Richard uh, uh, Branson start uh, Virgin Atlantic? If individuals can do it, if other governments can do it, why can't we do it? I keep saying so. Once the passion is right, nothing is impossible. I want Nigerians to also see that possibility in us to be able to run a successful airline business. I want Aquabomites to believe in ourselves that if others can do it, if every other person shies away from it, find out the turnover of most of these airlines is bigger than the GDP of the entire West Africa. What's the turnover of United Airlines? What's the turnover of Delta Airlines? What's the turnover of Emirates? So, and then look at the economic impact. How many people visit, you know, most of these places today? I was just listening to, the, to, to, to one of the uh, executive management staff of Ethiopian Airlines. Uh, our sympathies go to that airline uh, with, the, with the crash of yesterday. I, I really want to express our, you know, sincere sympathies especially also our condolences to the families of those that lost their lives. Uh, but when the guy was offering an explanation, you could actually see a business model that works in Africa, and that's an African airline business. Let us not even go to those ones that are quite long. Look at Rwanda today, Rwanda A. Look at the fleet that they have. Look at how the business model. Then he was telling us how Ethiopia, Addis Ababa is now a hub. Asia, they fly to over 100 countries. And as far as you fly that airline, you must come to this above before you connect to any other place in the world. So it creates a hub. It creates a whole lot of economic value. So when you are talking about Ibom Air today, we want all actually to see the economic value that we we'll derive. And also, if you look at those our five-point agenda, it can only be driven by three gateways. A, water, road. We are very aggressive in road infrastructure. We are very, very aggressive. You look at the, 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 the kilometers of dualized thoroughfare that we've done in the past three and a half years. It's unbelievable yes, under recession. Your Excellency, I was, I was going to come to that. Uh, Absolutely. No, I'm trying to link all. So the A, we can't, just be, you know, we can't just be passive about it. You can see even the upgrade of our runway. Let pilots tell you the recent upgrade that we did on our runway to category two runway. And the airport is own 
run and maintained by the state government. Only, the only one. Check. Check, that's the only airport run, maintained, and owned by the state government, and has a category two runway. Then, coming to our, our drive towards the deep seaport, you can see the stage we are today. Every single investor that is coming to talk about our deep seaport is telling you that in terms of best practices, in terms of following what airport development could be, that this is one of the best. And we are following those processes religiously because we want to show the world that we can also get it right. We can do things the right way and be consistent about doing the right thing. And be consistent about taking the mindset of the people towards that development. And that's what I set out for. So I want to thank um, regulatory agencies for the support they've given us on IBOM A, NCA, Federal Minister of Aviation, NMA, NAMA, all the names associated in making sure that we realize that dream. I use this platform to appreciate them and thank them. They are really, really, uh, you know, people that we can showcase for this country that is devoid of all those uh, bottlenecks that, that people do have. As of today, they've given us maximum support. I also want to use this platform to solicit for more support, that we are eager to start commercial flight. If they can actually help us, we've been ready like yesterday with manpower systems and structures on ground and processes. So if they can actually help us to jumpstart the commercial operations almost immediately. Aquaman people are eager to fly their airline. Aquaman people are eager to just see, you know, the ambience of a, a freshness of, of newer aircrafts in the air for, and, and also a very professional, uh, uh, you know, airline for that matter. So I think people are eager to, to, to have them on, uh, on, on the commercial run. So I really want to also use this platform to appeal for more support. A lot of support given means more support is still required, and that will enable us to start as soon as possible. Okay, yes, uh, you have uh, brought in 15 industries in... Uh, more than 15, because 15 I'm still commissioning more. Okay, all right, okay, okay. you talked about more. So uh, can you tell us uh, a bit more about the more you intend to do in the next four years? Um, what are we trying to do? First of all, we are trying to look at those areas that can drive employment for the youth. That's why we first of all had to go back to set up an industrial base that can take care of cottage industries, domestic market requirements. We look at what are the basic needs of the people on daily basis. Basic needs. Take for example, when I came into government, I felt so challenged that a country like Nigeria would be importing toothpick, would be importing pencils. Look at the number of pupils in schools at basic education level in Nigeria. Then look at the contribution of that to other economies of the world. So, and these are not rocket sciences. It, it doesn't matter, even if we have to bring in the lead, but let us not bring in the casing, the lead, the manpower, and keep you know, improving the economies of other people. Let's even also make use of what we have. We have labor. Take, for example, the basic raw materials for those pencils and toothpicks, they, they are available everywhere here. We can use that also to create wealth. What do you need? A ordinary bamboo. You just, you know, we'll, we'll go for a toothpick. But that's what we're importing. So that's why we started with that youth scheme, where those basic needs, daily needs, every day, people just make use of toothpick. Every day, pupils in school will write with pencil. And we started with all those smaller ones. Now we've gone into plastics. You could see everywhere in the world now, plastic, pet bottles, everything is just on daily demand. The increase is a whole lot. Even look at social engagements in Nigeria today. People love those disposables, plates, spoons, cups, and so on. And those are all plastic products. So you could see there was a yawning gap between the demand and so forth, and what you can actually do. So we are setting up those ones, toilet paper, you know, fiberglass, brick making, uh, paint, those basic cottage industries that will create employment and at the same time create value for our people. And that is what we are doing. Then you now go to the big ones. Every single household every day look forward to eating bread. But look at the entire region. How many flour mills do we have? So we now try to meet people at that point of need. Our people used to go out very far place, up to Lagos at times, to go and deposit money in order to get flour. And once you pay the deposit of that money, these people don't pay you interest on that money. So you're losing value of that money, time value of money. And they don't even give them specific time of supplies. So they were capitalizing on that, you know, uh, uh, demand supply gap to exploit 
you know, uh, people. And we say, look, what does it take? We have the connection. We are known. I mean, we've been in business all, all through. Uh, we've linked up with the outside world. Why can't we also convince those investors to come and invest in our own area? I mean, if they've been our friends over the years, that's actually what attracted us to talk to some of our friends who are there in Europe. Please, you've done this in your own country. We have a yearning gap. There's demand. A country with a population of close to 190 million people. You can't get it wrong if you go to anything, food or water. You can never get it wrong. Or healthcare. It's a whole lot. There's a whole lot of opportunities in Nigeria. And it takes people to try and talk. But there are challenges too, because they will tell you. I mean, I keep saying so, development and money will only go the way you feel secure. I mean, fine, they will raise those things. But you must have that moral, I mean, that power of persuasion where you must also let them convince them to know that, look, what you gain is much more. The return on investment in Nigeria is one of the highest in the whole world. The return on capital in Nigeria is one of the highest in the whole world. It's an emerging market. So higher return, fine. There could be higher risk. But it's, it goes hand in hand. They are conjoined twins. They higher the risk, they higher the returns. You might talk about the risk. But in food business in Nigeria, I mean, a whole lot of challenges will be there, no doubt. But I'm sure they will make a whole lot of money. That's how we came about setting up flour mills. Then you go to healthcare. There are a few things. Nigeria consumes six billion syringes every year as a country. And all those were imported from Asia. How can a country consume that, you know, that quantum? And then we're importing all. So we're actually trying to enrich other countries. That's why a whole lot of money we make in Nigeria does not stay in Nigeria. Look at how much we make out of crude oil. Every blessed day, we are producing crude oil. And the whole money filters away. Because every single thing we do must come from outside Nigeria. Why can't we just fix some here? Which is also what I'm looking at in Aquaibo. We can't be having a location every month and the entire location filters to other places in Nigeria or outside Nigeria. We must also have a way to create a value chain where a whole lot of that should be here to create a multiplier effect on the economy and make sure we have that uh, economic strength. This is what we look at. This is, these are the things I'm saying that we are trying to connect with the people. So if Nigeria alone consumes up to 6 billion syringes every year and we're not producing any, we are importing all, then you look at the cost of production. What does it take to produce syringe? Polypropylene. I mean, that's the basic content. The other one is just the machines and the mold. Fine, we don't have the technology for the mold and the machines. Ah, you can import the technology, but you need labor to be producing those things. You have polypropylene. Rubber people will also make money. That will also create a whole lot. So I still talk about the value chain. If you look at what we are trying to create in all this, take for example right now, why do you think we have problems of electricity? In most cases, the distribution company, not that they don't generate, like here, we generate 150 megawatts every blessed day. But what do we consume? They will keep telling you that people are not paying for their light. That's why they cannot actually supply electricity as demand is over here. And I'm just telling them, can we go into what we call power for all? What basic thing do we need? The same thing with telephone. Telephone would have still been suffering the same setback if it wasn't actually uh, unbundled. We can unbundle this and allow individuals to determine whether you want light or not. Consumption is the function of availability. I keep saying so, it's marketing 101. A lot of people should know that. So if the power is available, who will consume it? I must, I stand to be corrected. Today, your driver can miss his lunch, but he doesn't miss a recharge card for his telephone. He can miss his lunch. And electricity should even be much more, because even as you're here, electricity is running in your house. The fridge is running. Everything is working, even when you're here. As you're here, you're not using your telephone. So there's much more opportunity, business opportunity, even in electricity than telephone. All we need to do is to look at those policies, those bottlenecks, unbundle completely, liberalize the market, allow people to determine. Let it be an interplay of the market forces. This is what we are demanding. And that's why we started, that now, People, every household, what could help the distribution companies collect their money is the kind of digi uh, digital meter you install. So we set up a digital metering factory in our pipe. If we even supply only to the south-south, that company will make a whole lot of profit because the demand is huge. We can't even meet demand of the south-south, not to talk of the entire southern Nigeria, not to talk of the rest of Nigeria. So, there's a whole lot. That's why I say so much business opportunities in Nigeria. We need to sit down as a people to create it and also so that we can create wealth for our people, create employment, create everything. 
everything we need in Nigeria is available. Fine, we can start bringing in skills, we can start importing technology. No country has it all. Every country must depend on one another. At times, those countries that have technology, they don't have the raw materials. Some will have the raw materials, they don't have the labor, they don't have manpower. Go to Vienna now. Look at Austria with all their technological development. Look at the main, you know, look at the strata of, uh, you know, or segmentation of the public. Look at those in the middle, uh, I mean, the, 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 the youth group. It's dwindling. They have more of the aged people. So, but in Africa, we have it all. We have the labor, we have the raw materials. All we need to do is to try and see how we can bring that in a little, which is what is driving us towards all this. You can see even in our weather here, you can see palm trees here. They are all natural. Nobody, 90% of the palm trees you see are not planted by any man. It's planted by God. It's the vegetation of the whole area. Same thing with things like, uh, you know, uh, coconut and once you see these things, these are not rocket science. You don't need to give them fertilizer that much. Our soil is naturally rich. All the palm trees you see here, nobody puts fertilizer in them. And the yield, especially in terms of kennel, is marvelous. That's why we are setting up kennel crushing, kennel refinery all over the state now. I've just commissioned about two so far. Then we are about setting up the first major African coconut oil virgin oil refinery. Because if you check now, cosmetics, name it everywhere. It's in high demand. It's about $6 a liter. So if I have the weather, I have everything it takes for me to just grow coconut. I don't need to feed coconut with anything. Coconut yields for 99 years. The one my great-grandfather planted till today, you come to our family compound, he's still yielding bunches, healthy ones. So just put these things there and put a refinery where they will just plug the coconut, refine, and they will make money out of it. You can imagine how much is crude oil. If you can sell virgin coconut oil for $6 a liter, how many liters make one barrel? So multiply that. I think about 220, I'm not a mathematician. Make one barrel. So multiply that by $6, virgin coconut, you can see how much we can make. Look at even the, the palm kernel refinery that we're trying to crushing refinery, number of employment, what we'll do with that. And what did we observe here? What was the yearning gap? When I came into office, I discovered that our people spend so much time laboring from morning till night, crushing, cracking the kernel, and then going to the market. They don't even know appropriate pricing of this kernel. So I can say a whole lot about this economic something and uh, it will flow. Yeah. Let, me take, let me take you on, on this. Um, critics of your government have actually pointed out that in the area of road infrastructure, yeah. you have not done enough. Uh, what can you say to that and how can you promise uh, the people going uh, forward? Uh, the next th th that's strange. I I'm hearing that for the first time. Uh, I, because I don't want to, I don't want to compare ourselves with any anybody. But in terms of road infrastructure, I think I, uh, we've done more than more than expectation. And allow Kwaibon people to actually say that. You know, the critics will only say things that will make it sound good. They are they are fond of propaganda. That's what put them where they are today. It's all propaganda. It's an average Kwaibon person that will tell you how many kilometers of road that we constructed, or rehabilitated most of them ongoing a whole lot of them commissioned it's never been achieved i have the records i don't want to compare it's never been achieved by any government ever in three and a half years what we've done in terms of road infrastructure it's never been achieved i stand to be corrected and we have the records we'll bring it out it's never been achieved so when you say critics i don't know who those critics are i say this is government that is connected with the people so take opinions of the people you want me to check from you here right now we are linking the entire state connected from the airport, they will connect you to the east-west route. And we are also setting up what we call a regional coastal highway that will also drive our deep seaport business. These are pure state projects. From Uyo here, we connect from Uyo to Alai Storofe to Etinan. We are connecting Etinan to Eket, then Eket to Ibono. Ibono is where you have the Exxon Mobil. That's where you have the mobile uh, terminal. They've not seen road ever. All the contracts of road in that area are just gone down the drain. First time for somebody between a kid and Ibron is less than 20 minutes. It used to take us almost two hours. First time, as Ibron people, they are celebrating. Do I like store of here right now? Between a Tinan and East West Road, which is a major you know, economic uh, drive through, about 23 kilometers, we are about 90% complete now. Aquaban people are excited about it. The most talked about Uyi Korek Bene Road, when I came into government, it wasn't up to five kilometers done. As of today, I've added 19 kilometers of that road. One of the best, done by the giant in the industry, Julius Berger. Completed dualized. You need to drive through and see what we've done. 
I can go on and on and on in terms of rehabilitation and everything. And also, Kwaipo is one place you drive through. I'm sure when you even uh, when you were driving through the city, mention where you had potholes in Uyo City, whether you've seen one, except that was created overnight. So maintenance culture adds up to existing infrastructure. But in terms of road construction, we've done, we've, we've proven this. Well, internal roads opening up everywhere. I'm one governor that in one day within the real capital city, one day within a few minutes, in one day, I'm not saying in two days, I will commission 28 internal roads. And these are done to international standard with side drains. I don't like going to those things because those things are available for you to speak for yourself. So I don't know which platform you read that, but to Aquaibon people, they will tell you that they are out there to support me out of capacity and performance. In terms of road infrastructure, we've done much more than, in fact, expected. I don't like sounding that boastful, but at times you need to also let people know what you've done. And uh, I'm sure even AIT, you have a tip of some of these routes, how many kilometers we've done so far. And you can actually assess from those steps. I'm sure the Commissioner for Information will also like to play it more for you to see what we've done over this period. So I, I don't see any area where that we've been found that wanting. And mind you, Nigeria experienced one of the worst recessions ever since I was born in 2016 and part of 2017. So you put this together and see what we've achieved. And also, there should be a platform for comparative analysis. We have 36 states in this country. Go around 36 states. Look at the number. Roads can easily be measured. Quality can easily be checked by engineers. Check both the quality and then also the distance we've, we've done in terms of kilometers, in terms, I mean, for road infrastructure. You'll be amazed. We've gone a whole lot. And these are not like the Uyo, like the Tinan, all those dualized thoroughfares. If you check on them, you, I mean, you think they are federal government projects, but they are all state projects, properly executed uh, uh, to standard. Your Excellency here, uh, yeah. we have been uh, called uh, that our time is up. It has been a really stimulating That's quite fast. <laughs> it has been really a stimulating time here talking with you. Um, this is a special edition of Aquibom. Uh, 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 yes, uh, looking at uh, our quite boom discovery. Okay, and then of course uh, uh, we want to congratulate you. Thank on you. Your election uh, again. We would have talked more uh, on the election. I'm, I'm surprised you didn't talk more on the election yes, uh, uh, because um, <laughs> if you want to look at that the way that election went, let me just use this and summarize it about the elections. The pattern of voting that you saw in this state followed exactly what happened during the presidential. President, during the presidential and national assembly, we cleared all the 10 federal seats, all cleared PDP. The three senatorial seats, we cleared 100%. Coming to this one, the same pattern, we cleared all the local government areas. Right, Your Excellency, all the state seats of Aquaibom House of Assembly. Surely have so, time just for, for people to know, <laughs> so that when they come to boast for them in Abuja, ah, Aquaibom is it? Aquaibom is not represent PDP. <laughs> yes. So, let them know, let them stop boasting. So, right. we don't want to join issues with them. Because we don't want to bring ourselves to their own level. Right. But I want to we thank will, you. We, we, Let we, me thank we, all our quite people. Time, some time to talk to, <laughs> to the uh, governor, uh, His Excellency Udom Emmanuel, who has just uh, won a re-election. He will be in the government house for another four years. And that has been it uh, from Oyo, capital of Aquaibom State, uh, South South Nigeria, on uh, Discover Aquaibom here, a simulcast with Nigeria votes on your Africa independent television AIT. My name is Basi Edmanuel. I'll pass you back to our headquarters in Abuja.